A heartfelt um, welcome to all of you. Um, I had my prepared remarks, but you know, I'm so pleased that all of you showed up. Uh, thank you very much. I know it's been a very tough couple of years, um, and thank you for, for attending in person. Um, my name is David Stutzman. I am counsel to Seward and Kissel, and I am completing my third year uh, of term this summer as chair of the Estate and Gift Taxation Committee of the New York City Bar Association. And on behalf of the committee and on behalf of our chair-elect for the upcoming term, uh, uh, Kevin Matz, who's over here, I would like to welcome you to the 2020 Mortimer H. Hess Memorial Lecture, which has been sponsored by our committee annually since the late 1960s. And after two years of being remote and uh, conducting this lecture via, series via Zoom, uh, it brings me no end of pleasure to introduce to you our speaker, Professor Jerry Beyer, and to all of you in person. Mortimer Hess, who received three degrees from Columbia University, including law, was a pioneer scholar in the field of federal tax law and a recognized expert in trust and estates law. He began his career in New York just two years before the introduction of the federal income tax in 1913, and he continued to practice law until his death in 1968. An active member of the association throughout his career, he was remembered by the association at his death for possessing, quote, an incisive mind that combined in rare balance a broad knowledge of taxes, trusts, estates, and wills, which enabled him to develop a broad-gauged approach to estate planning, something all of us should strive for. He, completed a, he, he uh, combined a lively imagination with his legal scholarship and was not fearful of breaking new paths and techniques in his field. Following his death, Mr. Hess's family and former colleagues provided generous funding for the establishment of this lecture series in his memory. The subject of the lectures generally are related to the laws of trust, estates, and taxation, and past speakers, uh, including some people here, have included professors, authors, reporters, and noted practitioners and experts in their field. This evening, it is my great honor and privilege on behalf of the Estate and Gift Taxation Committee to welcome Professor Jerry W. Beyer to speak with us. Professor Beyer will be following in the footsteps of Mortimer Hess uh, by addressing his talk uh, on some distinctly new paths and techniques that we have increasingly available to us in the field of trust and estates law. Modern estate planning involves much more than planning for the distribution of clients' home or their corporate securities or money or tangibles. New types of property without tangible form are evolving rapidly from ubiquitous uh, electronic communications such as email, text, and social media explosions to the well-known realm of cryptocurrency and the um, growing use of ethereal non-fungible tokens or NFTs and on to the fringes of purchasing land and other property, including sneakers uh, in the metaverse, uh, the non-physical digital world. Without an understanding of these assets, which our clients are increasingly owning, attorneys will lack the sophistication necessary to provide sage advice for their estate planning clients. Professor Beyer is the Governor Preston Smith Regents Professor of Law at Texas Tech University School of Law and is an academic fellow of the American College of Trust and State Council, or ACTEC. During his 40-year academic career, Professor Beyer has taught, researched, spoken, and published in the areas of estate planning, wills and trusts, probate, and property. He's a prolific author, credited with more than 25 books, 40 law review articles, 35 other significant works, and 400 continuing legal education articles. That's quite, quite a number. <laughs> and is the editor of the most popular estate planning blog in the nation, which you can dive into by going to his website, professorbeyer.com. It's actually quite interesting. In recognition of his expertise and, and uh, contributions to the legal profession, the National Association of Estate Planners and Councils inducted him into the National uh, Estate Planning Hall of Fame in 2015. He currently serves as the reporter for the Drafting Committee on Electronic Non-Testamentary uh, estate planning documents for the Uniform Law Commission, uh, so not wills, and is charged with researching and drafting that new act. Uh, that's why he's here today. Uh, he was working on it yesterday, this weekend. In his scholarly research, Professor Beyer explores many facets of trust and estates law. For example, he's turning recently to the, his attention to such varied interests as non-fungible tokens, which he'll discuss today, electronic wills and trusts, planning for the transfer of and access to a person's digital assets, both during disability and following death, 
studying the impact of legalized recreational and medical marijuana on estate planning. Um, so what do we do when those clients of ours actually own a marijuana business? Exploring the potential of including photographs of items a person wishes to bequeath in his or her will. Um, investigating professional responsibility and ethical concerns that arise in estate planning, something that we always um, are cognizant of. After his lecture, Professor Byer will be happy to take some questions. He's also very keen to speak directly to you following the Q&A, and thanks to our friends at the association. Uh, they will fill that out, don't worry. Um, we can hope, hope to uh, continue the conversation with Professor Byer and with ourselves. Uh, without further ado, it's my pleasure to bring uh, turn things over to our 22 Mortimer Hess Memorial Lecture, Professor Jerry Byer, who will try to answer the question, is there virtual life after death? All right, well, it's so good to see you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. You know, after an introduction like that, I think I should just say thank you very much and, and go home. All right, well, to start with, I want you to know how deeply honored I am to be selected to present this lecture in honor of Mortimer S. Hess, who is, of course, a legend in the New York estate planning community. <laughs> of course, I regret that I never got to meet him. I mean, he passed away in 1968. I was like only 12. But I am sure I would have really enjoyed visiting with him and learning from his experience and wisdom. So what are we gonna do today? Well, today we're gonna take a cyber property journey from the familiar to the unknown. Our one hour mission is to boldly go where no estate planner has gone before. We're gonna start our journey with something we all have, electronic communications, texts, and email messages. And we'll focus on who can get those communications if we are disabled and when we die. Then we'll move outward, starting to look at cryptocurrency. And you're all familiar with cryptocurrency, such as Bitcoin. We'll gain some more outward momentum and look at non-fungible tokens. And finally, we will end our journey at the fringes of the known cyber world, the metaverse. All right, so let's start first with something we're familiar with email. And what happens to the emails? Can a fiduciary gain access? Why is it important for an executor, an agent, a guardian to be able to gain access to the email and text messages of a decedent or a principal or a ward? So here are the basic reasons. Access is important to help locate and manage regular assets, bank accounts, credit cards, utility, home mortgages, car loans, etc., especially since so many people now have dispensed with getting paper statements for these things. They are only electronic. And access can help fiduciaries deal with assets and debts, but also help them locate family members and friends. Now to understand, the current state in the law, we have to go back in time. We have to look at a little bit of history. It all started with eight states who had these very primitive statutes. Only two of those states still remain, Louisiana and Oklahoma. And then back in 2014, the Uniform Law Commission approved the Uniform Fiduciary Access to Digital Assets Act an act which we all, we, meaning estate planners, fiduciaries, thought was absolutely wonderful because it would give fiduciaries default access to electronic communications unless the person expressly said no. Delaware enacted it. Then it was proposed in 26 other states. And like the Hindenburg and the Titanic, it failed miserably. 26 out of 26 failures. Now, why do you ask? Well, there were two reasons. First, the strong industry lobby. They said, hey, federal law says we can't reveal unless the person gives permission. Your state law is going to say 
you have to reveal unless there's a negative provision granting no permission. This puts us between a rock and a hard place. We don't want to be there. Not only that, the privacy groups got involved and they said, look, people send emails and they don't think that they're going to be seen and they're not going to be printed. What if the person who sent it said something like, you know, what? I just finished my AA meeting last night. Or, hey, guess what? I just hooked up with my brother's wife. See, those things you wouldn't want revealed. So the industry groups and the privacy groups converged on those legislatures like locusts and made sure that the act failed every time. And then they came back and said, we'll show you. They proposed the Privacy, Privacy Expectation Afterlife and Choices Act, a draconian measure from the other side. No access unless there's express permission and court authorization. They actually convinced one state, Virginia, to adopt it. It has since been repealed. Well, when the Uniform Law Commission realized that their beautiful act was crashing, they immediately rewrote it. I've never seen anything like this. Within one year, they completely rewrote it into the revised Uniform Fiduciary Access, the Digital Assets Act, which we refer to as RUFADA. And it was approved in July of 2015 with the complete opposite approach. Fiduciaries do not have default access. There is no disclosure of contents unless there is express consent. And once that was done, the opposition to the act just crumbled away. Look at the endorsements. All the industry groups like Facebook and Google, all of the privacy groups like the Center for Democracy and Technology, and even other groups like AARP approved it. And with this widespread uh, endorsement, there was no longer any opposition. And so we have widespread enactments. Right now, there are 47.5 enactments. Yeah, now well, that means we got 45 states, the Virgin Islands in DC. How did I come up with that half? Well, it's because California adopted half of the act. They actually call it the Revised Uniform Fiduciary Access to Digital Assets Act. But the Uniform Law Commission says, no, no, no. Enacting half doesn't mean you enacted it. So they say it's not an enactment, but it actually is a half enactment. And right here in New York, it was enacted six years ago in 2016. And it's currently pending in Massachusetts. So let us now examine how this act impacts email communication, starting with the types of fiduciaries covered. Very broad, personal representatives of a decedent's estate, executors and administrators, agents under a power of attorney, trustees, court-appointed guardians. Now, before we go any further, we need to get an important distinction with regard to the things we get access to. We need to distinguish between contents and catalog. So let's study that. Access to contents means being able to read what the inside of the message says, to read the actual email, to read the texts, to read private postings on social media sites. This is allowed only upon express consent. And there are two main methods that are used to provide this express consent. So this is what you have to think about for your clients now. How to get consent if they want people reading the contents of their email messages when they're disabled or after death. Number one is the online tool. Number two, express directions in a will, power of attorney, trust, court order, appointing a guardian. Let's examine each of these consent methods. The first is the online tool. This is the, 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 the golden way of handling it. This is where the provider itself actually says, when you fill out your preferences and options, you indicate who can have access upon death or disability. Google was the leader of this, allowing it first nine years ago in 2013. 
Then came Facebook with its legacy contact in 2015. And just last year, Apple did it for all of their products with the digital legacy. This is the number one way, because if this is done, you don't have to worry about anything else we're talking about as far as access, because online tools control. So if you or any of your clients have anything governed by the Google empire, the Facebook empire, or the Apple empire, use the online tool. Well, but there's going to be a problem. And that is finding where to do this. It's hidden sometimes way deep in the settings. Why? Well, I was talking with the representatives of some of these companies, and they told me why. They don't want people thinking about being dead when they're subscribing and setting up their services, because that'll cause them not really wanting to use it as much. So you're going to have to dig a little to find the settings. Nicely, though, um, which one? One of them, I think it was uh facebook they made it a little easier not that long ago now if you don't have the online tool then you're stuck with having express consent so this means when you draft a will when you draft a power of attorney you have to expressly indicate whether you want the executor or agent to have access to the contents of electronic communications, emails and texts. You could grant full access to all of them. You could grant access to some, but not all, you know, because let's assume this, I'm sure it's not true for anybody in the audience or watching this, you are having an affair. Now, if you're having an affair, I'm sure you have a separate email address that you use to communicate with your paramour. Well, you probably wouldn't want to give that email address so they can see that one. So there might be some you'd say yes and some you wouldn't include in the list. Or maybe you're very private and you say, uh-uh, no one's reading any of them. It doesn't matter. Whatever your client wants, specify in the will and the power of attorney. That way they can get access to the contents and read the messages and get those benefits that we talked about earlier. Now, what if that is not done? Then it is still possible to get access to what is called the catalog. You can get access to the catalog without any type of express permission. This is better than nothing if no planning is done because you can get the name of the sender, the email address of the sender, and the date and time the message was sent. Not the subject line, not the contents, but this. But think how helpful this will be in the administration of an estate. If you get a message from a certain bank, you might think, well, maybe it's spam, but maybe it's because there's an account there. Or if you get something from a credit card company, hmm, maybe there's an account there, a utility company. It will provide you with some guidance better than nothing. So at least you can always get name of sender, email address, and date and time the message was sent. Think about an analogy here, a regular U.S. mail letter. If you have a regular U.S. mail letter belonging to somebody else, you can look at it. You can see the name, who it's to, the from, and the postmark, and you are not a federal criminal. You open up the letter without permission, that's a federal crime. Same thing like it is here. So contents only with permission, catalog you can get without express permission. Now with that in mind, we need to look at how each type of executor can gain access. We'll start with an executor getting access to contents. Well, you send a certified copy of the death certificate, that's not too difficult. A copy of the will showing express consent, that's assuming we don't have the online tool. If you, if you have an online tool, you don't have to worry about any of this. So a copy of the will that says there's consent, and then a certified copy of the document granting authority, your letters testamentary. If the person's in test state, you're sort of like out of luck to get access to contents. Now, the custodian could be happy with that, but they'll probably say, we need more information. We need some type of information that identifies the account and links the deceased user to the account because many people have email addresses that don't look like their name. So you got to prove that the email belongs to the decedent. 
because otherwise you might just have an email that says, I am best lawyer in New York at yahoo.com. And how do we know who that is? So that's why in the will or power of attorney, you might want to actually list the email addresses because that will provide that juncture. Usually it's pretty easy to prove. You've got account statements or email messages that have been sent to the decedent, et cetera. And then if the provider wants to, they can ask for a court order that says the account belonged to the decedent, disclosure doesn't violate federal law, the deceased user consented, and the material is necessary for estate administration. Now, if you wanna get access to the catalog, it's a lot easier. You just need the death certificate, your letters testamentary, and again, the provider can ask for that linking information with the uh, email address and the account, and a court order saying it belongs to the decedent, and you need uh, it for your estate administration. Now with that in mind, I wanna give you a very important bit of advice to remember. Many, if not all custodians say they want a court order. They're afraid, they're timid, they don't wanna get sued. So many providers say, oh, we're always gonna require a court order. So what do you do knowing this? If you want access to contents or catalog, you call up the provider, whatever it may be, whoever provides the email account, and say, what language do you want in the court order? Many of them will then send you exactly the language they want in the court order. And then you just plug that in a court order. And you can make, and my advice is, is to do it as early in the estate administration process as possible. Just stick it in any of the pleadings you have and get the judge to sign it and then the providers will be happy. So, very important point to take away, get this language in your court orders as early as possible to facilitate getting access, whether it's contents or catalog. So that takes care of the decedents. Now let's look at powers of attorney. If you want access to contents, you send a request to the custodian, including a copy of the power of attorney granting the agent access and the certification you swear under penalty of perjury that, yeah, the power of attorney is still in effect. And then the custodian can ask for the linking information. Now, here's where you have to be careful, dependent on state law. I don't know, I'll ask, does New York have a statutory power of attorney form? I see the audience saying yes. Now you need to study that. In some states, an automatic power is granting access to contents of email communications. And in others, it's not there. So you have to look at your form and be sure you include or not include whatever language you want if you want your agent to have access to the contents of the electronic communications. Now, if you just want catalog, it's way easier. You just need to send in a copy of the power of attorney with general authority. You don't need any specific authority in the document. You will also include that certification that the uh, power of attorney has not been revoked, that it's still in effect, and the custodian can still ask for that linking information. A lot easier. Now, our next fiduciary is a trustee. Now, Normally, if a trustee of a trust is using email, they're what we call the original user. The trustee is the one who creates the account that is then used to communicate with beneficiaries, settlers, businesses, etc. No problem there. The custodian has to provide full access to everything if the trustee is the original user. In the case where the trustee is not the person who created the account or who owns the account, then there are parallel procedures like those used for an agent that we discussed earlier. Now, finally, what about guardians? To start with, no automatic access. Just because you are a guardian doesn't give you any automatic access to contents or catalog. You always are going to need a court order. Now, without a, with, excuse me, with a hearing, the court can grant complete access. Without a hearing, the court can sign an order granting access to catalog, but not to 
contents. All right, so now in all these situations, you've sent off this request to the custodian. Now, are you gonna sit back and just hope they send stuff to you? Well, it might be difficult to get it. They have 60 days to comply. They can charge a reasonable fee. They can disclose on paper or electronically. And they can say they don't wanna do it because it causes us an undue burden, whatever that may be. And if the custodian doesn't comply, guess what? No penalty. There's no penalty on the custodian. They can just ignore it. They, if you want it, you're going to have to go to court and get them a court order directing disclosure, saying, look, they are basically in, they're not in contempt of court, but they're, well, if they had a court order, they might be. But you have to do that. And the fiduciary's estate is going to have to bear the costs, attorney fees, court costs, et cetera. Now, of course, if the custodian doesn't comply, there might be liability then if they don't comply with a valid court order. I've heard lots of anecdotal evidence of some custodians that are very nice and provide stuff and ones that don't. And many times it just depends on the person you talk with or the person who receives your request. So with all this, what do you do to plan for your client? Well, obviously, you have to ascertain your client's intent. I didn't put it on the slide, but don't forget the best thing is for the client to use the online tool. The online tool is the best thing. If there's no online tool, or even if there is and you want to have a backstop, find out their intent and document that intent in the will or the power of attorney. So that's our first step, email communications. Now we continue our cyber journey by looking at cryptocurrency. There's maybe 2,000 different types of cryptocurrency out there. Of course, you're most familiar with Bitcoin. And you know that Bitcoin is stored in what we call a digital wallet. It could be online in the cloud, it could be on a computer, on a phone, or it could be totally air-gapped on a special USB drive or other type of drive that you separate from being connected to another computer or the internet that it make it, makes it more safe. Now, we could spend a long time talking about all the details of how cryptocurrency operates, but that's not our task. Our task is to look at estate planning ramifications of cryptocurrency. So let's look at some basic advice. First, you have to know that the client either owns cryptocurrency or is actually mining, solving all the huge uh, mathematical problems that are required to create a piece of a, a cryptocurrency. And so I recommend you just include that in your initial questionnaire or client intake form. Then it is very important to keep records of when it is purchased and the price. Because cryptocurrency is not money, not currency, it's just property. And therefore, it can be subject to capital gains or capital losses. And then you must protect and transfer the private key or seed phrase that is necessary to access the cryptocurrency. And we're going to talk some about that because without the private key or seed phrase, the cryptocurrency is like gone and, and gone forever. There's no, oh, I forgot my password. And then you get it back somehow. Uh-uh. If it's gone and it's just stored on an exchange rather than in some sort of wallet, uh, you're, totally, you're, you're totally out of luck. I'll show you two examples. Look at this nice guy, James Howell. In 2009, old Jimmy here bought 7,500 bitcoins for some piddly amount and stored the private key on his hard drive. The bitcoins didn't have much value. He decided, oh, I got to upgrade my computer. And so he tossed the hard drive. Where? Into the car trash. And it ended up in the landfill. And I guess landfills keep track of where the trash comes from and what data was there. And so he's been out digging in the landfill, especially when Bitcoins were real high in price, and he's trying to recover it. Uh, he's even like said to the city, if you help me find it, I'll give you a cut. 
And he's even, I think, set up one of these Indiegogo or one of these funding things that try to get money to dig in the trash so he can find the hard drive that has the passphrase, the seed phrase, for all his Bitcoin. Here's another example. This is Stephen Thomas. He stored his private key on a flash drive. And he's got it. There's a picture of it. Got it right there in his hand. Well, it needs a password to open the flash drive, which has the, pass which has the seed phrase in it. Well, he can't remember the password that he used, but this is an iron key. It's the name of the brand. An iron key flash drive which says, if you unsuccessfully enter your password 10 times, it self-destructs. Just, just like, you know, the old Mission Impossible tapes being destroyed. It, it, it doesn't blow up, but it erases itself. He's tried eight times. He's got two left, and he's working now with tech experts to see if there's any way around the encryption. But the Iron Key people say, oh, no, we built this so it's not breakable. So he's working on that because, uh, you know, it's going to be all gone if he enters it two more times incorrectly. So that means you got to be sure your clients protect the seed phrase. Now, for those of you that may not, not be familiar, we have a pass, a long password, pass key, which is just a bunch of numbers and letters. But most of the cryptocurrency and other types of accounts have what is called a seed phrase. The seed phrase is 12, 14, 16 words that appear random. Chair, table, couch, fish, you know, a bunch of words. And those words in that particular order are what's needed to access the cryptocurrency. So what do people do with the seed phrase? Well, some go old school. They print it and put it in the safe deposit box and figure when the time comes, they'll find it there. That's not so bad. Others are afraid it's going to get lost and they have metal plates that they engrave it on to make sure it will survive fire, flood, tornado, earthquake, and other disasters. And then they'll hide it. They'll hide the paper or the flash drive or the metal plate somewhere. They'll bury it in the basement or in the, in the backyard. They'll do this to preserve it. And, they, and if you go on like the Amazon, you can find all sorts of special ways and special plates and everything. There's a picture of one there on the slide you can use. Now, some people will do other things. They'll take the seed phrase. Let's assume it has uh, 12 words. They'll give three words to four people. And the only way to get access is for those people to come together, sort of like bringing the infinity stones together. We get them all back together, and then they can access it. There's even a more sophisticated method called Shamir secret sharing. This is where the seed phrase is manipulated by a complex algorithm. And you say, okay, I want to create five seeds, but any three of them together can create the seed phrase. And so then you give five of them out, knowing that any three of those people can come together and decode that with the software and come up with the seed phrase. So there are all sorts of very complicated and sophisticated methods to protect that seed phrase, knowing that if you don't have it, you are out of luck. Now, one thing I just started to read about is using crypto in a 401k as a retirement asset. It seems that employers and retirement plan providers are starting to allow participants to place their retirement funds in cryptocurrency. Well, that's a huge risk given the volatility of cryptocurrency. And in fact, I just read that the Labor Department, which regulates company-sponsored retirement plans, has, and I quote, serious concerns about companies that do this. I mean, personally, you know, I wouldn't do it. I am very risk adverse. You know, I may never make a lot of money, but I'm not going to lose any either. I'm not stressed and I sleep really well at night. All right. Now, what about cryptocurrency in the decedent's estate? Well, if it's there, the personal representative clearly has a right to access it because that's accessing property, not the contents of communications, which we talked about before. 
Rufata gives the executor access to the actual physical property, the actual, well, physical or virtual, the actual property, that's not a problem. As long as they have the material, the passphrase, seed phrase, whatever, to get access to it. And you should document the value as of date of death because that cryptocurrency would be entitled to a nice step up in basis. Well, a couple of months ago, that would have been really nice. Now, maybe not so much. And the property will just pass under the will or by intestacy like other property. So if it's specifically given to somebody, that person gets it. If it's not, it will just pass by the residual clause. Now, the next thing we want to look at is using cryptocurrency as a trust investment. What do you think about that? Uh, don't think so. Think about the prudent investor rule. Investment decisions have to be made in the context of the trust portfolio as a whole and as part of an overall investment strategy having risk and return objectives reasonably suited to the trust. Well, I don't think cryptocurrency is reasonable. Think about it. Just in the past year, Bitcoin has ranged from under 20,000 to over $67,000, a 300% differential. That is not a reasonable risk. So corporate trustees that I have talked with, either they say, we're not gonna take it. That's just not what we do. Or if we take it, we sell it for cash the second we get it. But you might be able to get a corporate fiduciary to do it if you have you know, permission and consent of the set law or permission from the beneficiaries, a court order authorizing it, something like that to be sure to avoid liability. So that's our discussion of cryptocurrency. We now move on to our next virtual asset, the non-fungible token, the NFT. So let's start off by learning what one is. It's a unit of data stored on a blockchain that certifies that the digital asset is unique and not interchangeable. Are we good? No, I don't think so. That really doesn't make too much sense. So let's break it down. Let's start first with what they represent. They can represent any type of digital file, photograph, video, audio, music, artwork, gaming tokens, tweets, any digital type of file. So let's look at a real world analogy. Take a look at this picture. This is from, actually, Margaret and I were just last week at the UFO Festival in Roswell, New Mexico. You think I'm kidding. It was just boatloads of fun. And at one of the vendor's booths was this ad, and I got, got, got permission to take a picture and use it. She made all of these little cushion things. And her idea was, it's like an NFT you can hold because they're all unique, every one. There's no two alike, but you can physically handle it. By the way, you know that real, you think that one in the middle there's kind of pretty in the center? I don't hear anybody say anything. Well, I thought it was pretty, I bought it. Anyways, well, I figured she was nice enough to let me take the picture. All right. So this is trying to convey the message that they're unique, which is what NFTs are. So let's look at some more physical world analogies. The value of an NFT is similar to other collectibles, autographs, signatures, baseball cards, coins, stamps, comic books, all of these types of things that collectors want. The underlying item is still available not owned by the NFT owner, unless the NFT owner also created the underlying property. Here's an example. Let's assume I had a 45 RPM record. That's vinyl with grooves in it. Yes? Look, some of my students have never seen one. All right. But let's assume I had that 45 of Stairway to Heaven, autographed by Page and Plant. Do you realize, God, I wish I had that. Do you realize the value that would have? But remember, there's millions of copies of that famous song out there. It is just that that one, they autograph. That's the same idea. It's that you have an author autograph the book, 
a baseball card, especially if it's signed by the, uh, the athlete or pictures of, you know, uh, actors or actresses or singers that are signed. Now, you may think, well, this sounds a little bit like nonsense, but I want you to go back to the physical world again. This is the oldest known baseball card. It's from 1865. Who would have thought the person who said, let's put a picture of baseball players on little pieces of paper? And that would be visionary. Remember, back then, photography had just started, just like digital stuff now is just starting. And so isn't this really the same thing in a digital world? Here's another scrap of paper. The Honus Wagner baseball card is worth about $6.6 .6 million. So is all of this going to then translate to the digital world, to NFTs as well? Well, I think it's good to have a little greater background in how NFTs are created. They are created on a blockchain very similar to cryptocurrency. Right now, Ethereum is the most popular. Instead of Bitcoin, it's Ethereum. And the creator, who's typically an artist of some sort, will link the NFT to a specific item of intellectual property that it represents, the photograph, the video, whatever. Now remember, the NFT is not the intellectual property. All it is is a reference to it. The NFT is just a, a reference with a unique internet address so that whoever has that internet address can see the NFT, but they don't actually, quote, have anything. And then the creator will say, oh, I'm not going to make any more. I'm making just one. Keep it rare. Or maybe they'll say, I'll make 10. And this is number one of 10. This is number two of 10 to keep them rare. And they can even now include smart contracts so that as they're bought and sold, the creator gets a cut of every sale that occurs. So it's a way of making money. And basically, that's the whole idea between behind NFTs is to provide collectors something that they value by making them scarce and with verifiable proof of ownership. Think about if you buy, well, they're after me now, if they have a... Uh, a piece of artwork or something, there's always the problem of providence, right? Maybe it's not real. Well, here we have an ascertainable chain that we know for sure it is legitimate. And then it becomes very similar to everything else in the collectible world. Physical art, rare baseball cards, coins or stamps. The value is because it's unique or hard to obtain and people want it. And this is a way of giving digital creators the same way of making money as their creators of physical assets. And if they're scarce and the person's important, it might be valuable. Do you think one of these could be valuable? How about this one? That one sold for over $69 million. And all it is is an NFT of this picture it's called Every Days, the first 5,000 days by the artist known as Beeple. And all this dude did, maybe it's a dude ass, I'm not sure, is took a picture every day for 5,000 days and then put the pictures all together in this collage. And all of a sudden, that's worth almost $70 million, which I'd have thought of that. Anyways, that was just auctioned off by Christie's on March 11th of 2021. So you can see that these things could have extreme value. Now, where else do you see NFTs? Gaming items. And that makes sense because video games are already in the digital realm. Uh, now, what you're looking at there is a digital kitten called Dragon, and it sold for $172,000. The game is Crypto Kitties. Maybe you or your kids or grandkids maybe even play it because normally it's cheap. They only cost like $10, $20 a piece. They're really, most of them are not very expensive. What you do in the game, I guess, is you take these different uh, kitty icons and then you breed them and then you get new kitties and then they're valuable. I guess that's what they do. I don't know why that one's so important. Now, 
The other realm where you're going to see a lot of this is in sports because they already have collectible items. On the right hand side, excuse me, on the left hand side of the screen, you're looking at the, one of the NBA's top shot sporting NFTs, which is called LeBron James Dunk from the Top, and that sold for $208,000. Now, I got the picture right there. You're watching it. You can get it at home, have it for free. But if you had the NFT, you paid $208,000 for it. On the right hand side, you see Major League Baseball getting into it. Just on July 4th of 2021, they started. This one, they sold an NFT of the audio recording of Lou Gehrig's Luckiest Man speech, and that sold for about $70,000. Now, there's some other interesting NFTs I want to show you. On the left side of the screen, you see an example of one of the Bored Ape Yacht Club NFTs. It is a collection the author who did this created 10,000 of these board ape NFTs. The average price to buy one is one half million dollars. Okay, on the right hand side of the screen, you see something that didn't work. This was Corvette, and they created this NFT of this lime green vet. And they said, Look, you can bid on this. And in addition to the NFT, guess what you'll get? You'll get the car. And we'll promise never to paint one in that color. So not only do you have the unique NFT, but you're going to have a unique car. And just a few weeks ago, they put it up for auction. No bids. It was a complete failure. And I think the reason was they stated that the minimum bid had to be $238,000. That was the minimum bid, and so no one bid that for the car. Now, this is kind of fanciful, but you can think in the future of some pretty nifty applications of NFT technology. For example, Nike is considering a system whereby every shoe would get an NFT token to verify the shoe's authenticity, because I guess there are people who collect shoes, right? baseball card stamps to collect shoes and there's a lot of knockoffs so this way they could verify that the shoe was legitimate some people they say we could use nfts as a secure method of transferring title to real property or other things and maybe it would be the key method to store electronic wills now i know new york doesn't authorize electronic wills but there are now 10 states that do and so this could be a way of really giving them some firm protection. Now, have NFTs been involved in any lawsuits? Well, there's one good one I want to talk about, and that's Thayer versus Matt Furry. Let me tell you about this story. This gentleman, Halston is his name, he purchased this NFT. This is an NFT of Pepe the Frog, and he paid $537,000. For an NFT of that picture. And the creator, Matt Fury, said, Okay, I really did make a hundred of these, but the other 99, I'm never gonna sell them. I'm never gonna give them away. But it turned out he lied. He gave away 46 of them for free, which of course, reduced the value considerably of this one NFT. And on March 12th of this year, he filed suit. And he said, either I want all my money back, or I want you to reclaim all 46 NFTs you gave away. Like, how would that ever be done? Or he wants damages for the lost value. And then he wants punitive damages saying that, you know, the creator knew right from the beginning he was going to give away the other ones and just lied to get more money. This case is actually going on right now. It has no result, no settlement, no anything. But you can see that these things now are bringing up some significant litigation. So now we're going to look at some NFT estate planning issues. And you will notice they are very similar to the cryptocurrency issues. If it's in the estate, you have a right to access it. But again, you're going to need the access information because usually for NFTs, they have passwords and seed phrases because they're stored on the blockchain, just like 
cryptocurrency. And again, document the value of the NFT so you can get the step up in basis. But of course, how do you find someone to value these things? The IRS even says to have a good valuation, the person needs like, what, two years experience doing it? Well, how are you going to find someone who has two years experience valuing something that is so new? So I don't know how you're going to do that, but that's what you got to think about. NFTs as a trust investment, same discussion for cryptocurrency, very volatile. Let me tell you an example. Last year, this person, Sina Estevai, he purchased an NFT of Jack Dorsey's first tweet for $2.9 million. Jack Dorsey was one of the original CEOs of Twitter. And he paid $2.9 million for the first tweet. Then in April of this year, he said, man, I want to sell it. So he put it up for auction, and he wanted $48 million for it. And he got some bids. The high bid, $280. That's it. So he paid $2.9, wanted $48, and uh, he didn't take the bid, but uh, the highest bid he got was $280. So look at the volatility of that. How do you know what the value is? He bought it for $2.9, but can't sell it now for $280. So how do you determine a value? So you've got to be very, very careful about investing in these things. What do you do as advice again? You've got to ask your client if they own or intend to purchase NFTs included in your standard client questionnaire. Know that if they have just one, it could yield a taxable estate if the value is high. And as we talked about for cryptocurrency, protect and transfer the private key, seed phrase, and the other information needed. Got to track the price paid and the amount received for the capital gains or loss calculation. And then things can get a little complex because most people who buy NFTs buy it with cryptocurrency. So the transaction of purchasing the NFT itself triggers a capital gain or loss. So that's something you have to be sure that you work with. And another thing you might want to do is hold the NFT in an entity like an LLC, because it is sure easier to transfer fractional interests in an LLC than it is to go through and do a blockchain transaction. And you might be able to get transfer tax discounts because of the minority interest or lack of marketability and asset protection. And then there are some potential future issues to worry about. Maybe they'll be subject to federal securities law. Maybe they'll be deemed commodities and then subject to regulation by the Community Futures Trading Commission and other such things that may come around in the future. Well, we're now reaching the fringes of established virtual property, and we're going to take a look at the metaverse. Now, we start with a very basic definition, a network of 3D virtual worlds focused on social connection. Now, you may be thinking, man, this sounds really new. But look at this. The term was coined in the book Snow Crash 30 years ago. In 1992, Neil Stevenson coined that term. And the book involved things we now don't think are that strange. Virtual real property. 3D avatars that you use and things that weren't even possible back then, but now we accept. Now, how did this idea of the metaverse sort of get into the mainstream? Well, it got into the mainstream through video games. That's how it got started. For several decades now, multiple player online video games have created virtual realities where players interact with the environment, other players, game-specific characters, some are fighting and warlike, some are cooperative like Second Life. You might have heard of World of Warcraft, Entropia Universe, and there are many others. And so for years, people playing these games have been accumulating virtual property, which turns out to have some value. Let me tell you an example. Well, there was this gentleman. He was playing the game Entropia Universe. By the way, Entropia Universe claims to be the longest continuous running metaverse. It is now 19 years old. 
that this game has been in operation and the avatars and property acquired in it have remained constant for almost two decades. Well, one of these players in the game decided that instead of just virtual stuff, he wanted some real money. Maybe he wanted a date, don't know, but he needed some money. But he didn't have any money, but he had in the game a virtual planet, he had a planet. So he put the planet up for auction. Six million dollars, that's what he got. Six million US cash dollars he got. And other people have sold stuff, a space station sold for 635,000. And I just read earlier this month that a Texas man took his entire life savings and invested it in property in the Entropia universe. Now, in addition to these video games, how else are these virtual worlds being used? Law firms are using it. Right here, Arnett Fox is using it. You, get, you meet your clients there. You're there, you've got a little avatar, and you're there, and your client has an avatar, and then you start talking with each other. Businesses are using it to buy and sell real world assets, to have meetings, to have conferences. Even Actec did it a while back. We had a meeting room and we'd all have little avatars and we'd go table to table and talk with people. Entertainment, concerts, sporting events. Big name companies are getting into this. Nike, Gucci, JP Morgan, Warner Brothers. And what's gonna happen in the future? Well, as technology advances, things are gonna get better. We're gonna have much higher quality virtual reality headsets. In other words, not the traditional gaming headset that people use now, or computers, or TV screens. They're gonna be much bigger, resolution's gonna be better, it's gonna be more interactive. And the key is what people wanna do is have the virtual realities expand from being game or company specific to being interactive and networked. So you'll have one place where you can go from one to another. So if you like World of Warcraft, you can take your avatar and your property there and bring it over to Entropia Universe and take it over to Second Life. You can use your avatar and your virtual property in all the different worlds. So you think of it as being, instead of these all these different virtual rule, uh, worlds being like walled castles, they're gonna all like have roads in between them. So you can go on a road trip, take your property from one virtual world, move to another. But the standardization that's gonna be necessary to travel between the different virtual worlds with all your stuff intact is gonna be challenging from two perspectives. One, technology, and second, intellectual property rights, because they're very protective of how their games operate, how their assets work, and so on. But that is the goal of the metaverse, to try to travel between the different worlds in the virtual life. Now, let's look at virtual property and how it's gonna impact a little bit in estate planning. Well, virtual assets are often bought and sold with cryptocurrency, raising all the cryptocurrency concerns, and the virtual assets, these space stations and all of this, are often represented by NFTs. And we want to look at a new, a new trend that is coming in. People are paying, investors are paying millions of dollars to have plots of land in various metaverse games. I already told you about the Texas person buying all the Entropia universe. Of course, there's huge uncertainty whether these are of any value. One of these universes is called the uh, Teliaverse. Anyways, I decided to check it out. So I went and I bought our house, Margaret and I's house. I bought it cost about a hundred bucks. Now I did a little checking a few days ago, and if you want to right now, the flat iron building here in New York is $432. The Singer building is $632. And if you want Fairfield Pond, you're gonna have to shell out $6,073 to own that. And of course, places like the US Capitol or the Empire State Building, they're going to have much higher values. So what do you have to do about this as an estate planner? Well, you got to inquire. You got to ask them, you know, ask your client, you know, you a gamer? Now, you might be a little embarrassed to ask that. I got an idea. Do you live in your parents' basement? Just might get just about an equivalent answer. And I'm just kidding. I said that once and someone came up and said, I'm a video gamer and I live upstairs. I said, I was just teasing. All right, all right. 
But you have to find out this. You have to ask because they might be a gamer and have all sorts of assets in the virtual world. And you've got to figure out what their values would be, how they're going to transform, preserving all the information they need to transfer them from one generation to another, to manage them upon disability and so on. And we have all the concerns we've looked at all night, passwords, seed phrases, all of those types of things are the same. Now, there's one more thing to be concerned about with the metaverse. That's emotional issues. You see, they're going to be avatars of all your deceased family members and friends. Yeah. Amazon already has a feature for Alexa. It's not released yet. They need one or two sentences of someone's voice, and then they can create a voice for Alexa that sounds just like that person. And then IBM, excuse me, Microsoft has a program where they're going to create artificial intelligence chatbots based upon a person. So they'll look at all your email messages, texts, recordings, writings, anything they get, and they create a chatbot, an artificial intelligence that reacts like you do, and now it's going to sound like you. So what do you think about that? after your family members are dead. Do you think you'd like to go into a virtual world and start interacting with them? Does that sound really cool? Cool. Not one person in the audience raised their hand. How many think it's like beyond creepy? Yes, almost everybody raised their hand. Now, of course, there's another thing. This has nothing to do with estate planning, but you gotta be careful. Because this technology exists and they only need a sentence or two, when you talk to someone on the phone, you're not going to know whether it's them because of this ability to mimic a voice. So I recommend that with all your friends and family members, you come up with like a, a, a secret word so that when they call, they say, hello, how are you? 32 or, you know, blue something so you know it's really them because with this technology out there, there can be a huge potential for fraud. All right. Well, we're now reaching the end of our voyage, and we're voyaging home, but not with whales that work. One, one person, hey, thank you very much. All right, I'll take anything I can get. All right, thank you. But now we got knowledge of virtual property and how to handle it, and what is the future gonna hold? Well. More clients are going to have this, especially your younger clients. So you've got to know about it. And the value is going to remain really volatile, which has really been demonstrated just in the last few months with the value of NFTs and cryptocurrency being extremely diverse. And in fact, I like what Bill Gates said recently about NFTs and cryptocurrency. He said it's all based on what is called the greater fool theory. Now, what is the greater fool theory? It's that you have fool number one who purchases an overvalued asset and then sells it at a gain to a greater fool. And so he thinks this is all ridiculous and, you know, not really such a bad thought. So what is the moral? What is the lesson we take away from our discussion today? You're going to have to keep informed and be ready to adapt. To provide the best service to our clients, we cannot ignore these developments. There's going to be rapid changes. The developments are likely. We must keep informed and adapt. Virtual property is here. We can't stick our head in the sand like the proverbial ostrich. And as you would see on the right, for our Star Trek fan, resistance is futile. It is coming. And now our journey from the virtual world is over. We are back to the physical world, and we have a little bit of time now before our reception. So does anybody have any questions or comments about anything we have discussed this evening? Don't be shy. Yes, ma'am. All right, the question is, isn't this sort of paralleling copyright and licensing? It sure is. And even you can go back further. It's paralleling a lot of all sorts of 
non-tangible property development, even going back to stocks and bonds, when all of that intangible property was being developed. So yes, you're going to see a lot of analogous concepts. Yes, sir. Okay. The question is, what do I think the best practice is for preserving a client's seed phrase? That is a difficult question. One thing you could say, give it to me and I'll keep it safe. Well, I don't think any client's going to do that because that's giving them the key to the kingdom. I would say that you should recommend the different methods and then have a client choice. So the safe deposit box method, the splitting the phrase, the engraving it. And the key, I think, would be find out what the client has done and then keep track of that in your file. So if the client says, oh, I'm going to put it in the safe deposit box, that's what you keep in your file. So that later you can say, the client told me this is what they're going to do. Now, if the client does want to give it to you, they could give it to you in some sort of encrypted form, but then someone else would have to have the password to unencrypt the encrypted thing. Yes. <laughs> All right. The the question the the statement was that if you really want to understand how NFTs operate, go create one. There are sites where you can do it for free, where it doesn't even cost you anything. And I think it's a great experience to go through all the steps of setting it up, getting a digital wallet, getting the seed phrase. She said she wrote it down on a piece of paper. Well, but I'll tell you, that's what I did with mine. It's on a piece of paper. But of course, the only, uh, the only thing I have in there is the NFT, which I then sold, the AgTech one. But it's very important to go through the process because you'll, un you'll understand more by going through it once than I could ever tell you. So have some fun. You can go and, uh, uh, like I said, do it for free and then you can just keep it or you could auction it off or whatever. Yes. No, yeah, sure, go ahead. Right. What she's explaining, I have to repeat this so the people can hear that are watching this, uh, is that not only do we have the volatility concern as a corporate fiduciary, but the safety concern of what would happen if by chance you would lose, misplace, copy wrong, the seed phrase, the past phrase. Absolutely. It's way too risky, I think. Yes, in the back. The question is, how do you prevent somebody from taking any recording of your voice, including what you just said, if it was loud enough to be picked up, and then going to Microsoft or going to the Alexa, Amazon people and having them create a recording of your voice? Well, there are rules in many states, I don't know about New York, in dealing with name, image, likeness protections. So if you're in a state that has those statutes, you might have a remedy because they can't do that without your consent. So if they do it, sue them for damages. But you're, you're right, it would be too easy to do. Yes? Yeah. 
The question is, am I aware of any actual litigation uh, regarding a corporate fiduciary keeping or not keeping uh, cryptocurrency, NFTs, et cetera? I'm sure there's probably some out there, but I am not aware of any actual litigation. The biggest one I know about now is fighting over that NFT. Sure. You have a question? I do, but um, please. Yes. The question is, how are we going to classify these types of digital assets with regard to location? Where are they located when they're just stored on the internet? Well, in my opinion, you start with the beginning. It's personal property. And normally, personal property is governed by the law of the person's domicile. And so that's how it would be governed. In a trust document, for example, you can indicate the law of the state that you want it to be governed by in many cases. So I would say that if you had crypto assets, you know, virtual assets in an estate, in a trust, it would be governed by whatever state was specified. I don't think you can transfer it into something called real property. Now, that's just my opinion. I don't have any like authority for it. It's just that I do think it's just regular personal property, no different than the way you would handle a stock, bond, financial account. Yes? Okay. The Right. The, the question is, could you convert one of these virtual assets into a tangible asset? And I don't really think so. You may be converting the access information into a tangible asset, a plate with the seed phrase. But I don't think you're converting the actual cryptocurrency, NFT, metaverse property into something tangible. It'd be no different than saying, because... Uh, you have a bank account statement that that now makes it in the state where persons has the, the statement as opposed to where the account is. I think, I think some of the states are now considering um, sales tax issues with respect to um, NFTs, I believe. Yeah. The, the question is, are some states considering sales tax? Well, it's personal property. Uh, it's being sold. Of course, many times intangible property like there's no sales tax when you buy and sell stocks or bonds, but there was no reason why a state couldn't impose a sales tax on cryptocurrency, on NFTs, on virtual property. They could do it. Any other question? I think I saw you had your hand up. Uh, the question is, what if you have cryptocurrency, NFTs, etc., and 
the seed phrase is totally lost. Maybe the person loses it because of dementia, they never recorded it, and they die. Where is it? It's just gone. Yeah, you might say that it inures to the state. It, it's, it is part of the estate. It might be unclaimed property after a while, but there is no way to get it. If, if you don't have the seed phrase, there's no way to get it back. It's like, it's like gone forever, dematerialized. It's there, but no one can ever get it. Yep, you, she's waving her hand in the air. That's just gone. And that's absolutely right. Yeah, I know it's very strange. It's, it's assets that would be literally unrecoverable. Yes. The question was, what if you know this person has the hard drive? Here it is. And on there, we know there's $2 million worth of Bitcoin under current market price at date of death. If you can't access it, it has no value. Absolutely no value because you can't get to it. That's my argument. Zero value. Well, I don't think so because there is no way to get... Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. You're thinking like the Rauschenbergy thing with the eagle on it and all. Yeah, but there was something physical. Here, got the hard drive, but you can't get to it. I'd, I'd say, fine, IRS, here you go. Two million dollars, you figure it out. But no, it's actually gone. I, I don't think you can give it a value. All right, we have one minute left for a last question before we recept. All right, so. As our journey now is over tonight, remember that when you plan for your client's estate, you must take into account their cyber property and carry out their intent with regard to the electronic communications, cryptocurrency, non-fungible tokens, and their metaverse holdings. I am very honored again to be with you tonight, and I had a lot of fun, and I hope you learned something that you can use.